Everyone's taller than me. <laughs> Rudiger laughs. You'd rather be smarter than taller. Hmm? Yeah. I can also turn it. <laughs> so hi, I think I know most people here. Um, for those that I don't know, hi, I'm Warren Kamari. Um, day job is Google, but I'm speaking in a personal capacity, as I think is everyone here. Yep. <clears throat> so this is going to be a short sort of panel thing on operators and the IETF. Um, it's actually really a plea for more participation and feedback and help. So like most large organizations, the IETF has a mission. And the mission of the IETF is to make the internet work better by producing high quality, relevant technical documents that influence the way people design, use, and manage the internet. The important bit in here is the word relevant. Um, we all know what our networks look like. Unfortunately, we don't know what all of your networks look like. Um, networks look fairly different. It would be really boring if they were all the same. But if we don't know what your network looks like, and if we don't know what works well in your network, what we end up writing is not going to be relevant and is not going to be very useful to you. So please come and tell us what your network looks like. Um, back in around 2015, Chris Grunderman, I think I saw Chris lurking in the back somewhere. Hey, Chris. Um, did a sort of survey of the industry, um, operators in the IETF, and he got around 350 responses or so. And this was from you know, people at Nanog and Ripe and Apricot and just sort of generally in the industry. And it identified a couple of sets of issues. Um, some of them are nice and easy to solve. Um, things like 8% of people don't know what the IETF does. That's fairly easy to solve. We can provide some, some guidance on that. 58% uh, of people would like to be able to participate, but just don't know how. Um, also, 54% of people know that work happens on mailing lists. That means that 46, you see, I can do math, 46% of people don't. Um, yeah, I know, it's quite impressive, isn't it? Um, some of the issues that were identified are unfortunately harder to solve. For example, 64% of people don't have enough time to participate. They'd like to, but just don't have the time. Um, more worryingly, 44% of people think that their operator input would not be welcomed. Another thing that we heard a bunch of times is people would like to be able to participate, but just don't have the funding to be able to come to meetings, you know, or once against time. Um, so for doing the easy ones, um, work in the IETF takes place in working groups, and the working groups are clustered together into areas. I'm Warren, um, I'm one of the, I'm sort of on the ops side of the ops and management, ops and management area. Um, we have Spencer. Spencer is one of the transport ADs, and then Lee Howard and Jeff, who are both part of the Internet Architecture Board. Hey, down there is Benoit. He's my co-AD. He's on the management side of Ops and Management, and Elvaro is down the end. Um, so they were doing a quick update each on their areas in a bit, um, but participation is open to sort of anyone who's interested. And we really mean that. If you're interested and want to participate, please come and do so. Um, as I said earlier, work takes place on the mailing lists. Um, we do have three in-person meetings each year. But you know, many people can't, can't manage to attend those. Remote participation actually works really nicely now. And so you can definitely participate you know, without coming to meetings. Obviously, we'd love it if you come. But if you can't, remote participation works. And down here, this URL www.ietf.org slash about slash participate. If you want to know how to get started, follow this link or come and talk to us. Um, after this, we're going to be hanging around outside in the big tent. It's just outside beer and gear. We have laptop stickers. Come talk to us and stickers. Um, again, this URL, but also, you know, feel free to just join some of the mailing lists. Um, it's not only participation. If you wish, you could present remotely as well. Um, yep, join some of the lists. Also, if you have a document that you'd like to write and you know just want to know how to get started, what you can do, etc., please come along and talk to us. Um, we don't bite. We'll be around all week. Um, and again, you really don't have to attend meetings. 
join the lists, read some documents, contribute, etc. I know a number of people here already do so. You know, also feel free to chat with them. And, oh, the slide. <clears throat> so, the IETF has sort of an unofficial motto, which is, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. Um, yeah, <laughs> some um, So, I mean, we're actually making a lot of progress on this. The last couple of IETFs, we've had um, the IETF hackathons, and we're getting a couple of hundred people coming along and participating. Um, we've got a fair bit of work done in them, and large number of projects being worked on. Some of this is sort of interoperability testing. A fair bit of it is also, you know, adding new features to new implementations, and also writing new implementations from scratch. Um, a recent one was also doing a bunch of testing on IPv6 transition technologies, um, identifying stuff like NAT64 issues, etc. And this is the slide that I'd actually thought was next. Ben was going to do a short, short bit on the management right. side. So yes, I, I'm Benoit. I'm the responsible AD for operations and management. Uh, actually, I've been doing that for six years now. And uh, next month, I will step down and be happy again. <laughs> uh, the the next AD, the next AD will be uh, Ignas. Ignas is there, and uh, so feel free to discuss to us, including Ignas. So that's the first thing I want to say. So uh, being responsible for uh, operations, typically when I would see a session like the previous one about beer, great protocol, I would be asking, great, but you know, if I can't manage it, well, it doesn't exist for me, right? So do you have something like a, a Yang model to configure and to monitor the, this protocol? Otherwise, you know, for my network, it doesn't work. So uh, this is a big part of what we're doing in operations and management, data modeling driven management. And I printed yesterday on that topic about NetConf and RESConf and how you know you should pay attention to how you manage your network with data models and, and APIs and all this. Uh, so what else, there is something I want to discuss for just one minute. We've got like a buff at the next ITF about network slicing. So uh, we want to, to evaluate whether we have the right problem set, whether the ITF is the right place to work on network slicing, and in this specific approach, they want to work from a top-down approach, right? And so that's something that we, we want to look at. Uh, so speak to us, and if you don't want to participate in the mailing list, I mean, at least get the feedback during uh, the evening. I will most likely be at the bar. Beer. Beer. I'm Spencer Dawkins. Uh, I come in peace. I am uh, not speaking for the rest of the IETF, uh, nor for my funder, but only for myself. I'm one of two transport area directors. And when I say transport, I mean protocols above uh, IP, like TCP. Ian talked earlier today about uh, two recent trends in transport protocols. One is user space implementations that use UDP as an encapsulation, and also the increasing use of encryption that covers not only the transport protocol payload, but also significant parts of the transport header for a variety of reasons. Now, the two impacts of, this trend, of these trends, first, user space implementations can change much more rapidly than kernel space implementations. So transport protocol behaviors can change much more rapidly than they have in the past. And any operator practices that rely on looking at unencrypted traffic aren't going to work well on encrypted traffic. And that's where you folks come in, I hope. Uh, I have a, I have a s specific ask uh, for input from operators about what you need in order to monitor and manage networks carrying a lot of encrypted traffic. We're working on ways to at least monitor encrypted traffic in the internet protocol performance measurement group, IPPM. And as you'd guess, they're using IPv6 extension headers to carry information through a network without looking at transport headers or payloads. We're at the very beginning of this work, and I want to make sure that we do the right thing. Um, we've been asking for input from operators about networking with encrypted traffic for a while. The, Internet Architecture Board held a workshop about this in 2015. 
but I, I feel like I, we still don't have the kind of input that makes me feel confident that the current trend in transport protocols aren't going to cause problems that operators can't solve. So you're all invited to participate in those discussions about this in the ITF. Warren put up the slide about how to do that. If that doesn't work for you, I'm probably the only guy in a pink t-shirt at Beer and Gear, and I'm all ears. Thank you in advance for your help. Hi, uh, Alvaro Rutana. I'm one of the three um, routing ADs. Uh, routing has three because it's a very big area. We currently have uh, 28 working groups. Uh, we do everything related to normal routing, everything that, that you can imagine, BGP, ISIS, OSPF, things like that. You've heard other topics today and yesterday. Uh, beer uh, came out of the, or is, is still in the routing area, of course. EVPN, uh, other multicast, uh, the RPKI was mentioned a couple times. That is work that has been done in the routing area. Uh, beyond the normal routing, uh, MPLS, uh, work around uh, IoT, Ripple, which is the routing protocol for uh, small constrained devices, mesh networks, et cetera. Whatever you can imagine uh, related to routing, uh, we, we try to do it there. Um, there are a couple of things that uh, I want to point out. I can't go over all 28 working groups, but one of the recurring topics that happens uh, all the time, every time we publish something, a new document, is around security. Uh, what about authentication? What about integrity in, in routing? Uh, how is it being used? Who's using it? Why are we not using it, for example? Uh, as many of you know, um, the authentication mechanisms in the specifications are not necessarily up to date. So if you've been following, BGP still specifies MD5, which we know and understand has you know, security issues. So one of those, the topics that we keep discussing that we are going to continue discussing at the next meeting, which is actually a month from now in London, is around what is needed from an operational point of view in terms of security, both authentication, integrity, but other things as well. And the other thing I want to mention is uh, some of the new work that we're doing in the routing area is around uh, data center routing. So we've noticed that the increase in size and uh, flexibility and, and trying to reduce operational costs in large data centers makes or, or forces the need to have a different type of routing protocol than the normal ones that we have today, OSPF, ISIS, BGP, even though those are, of course, applicable as well. So we chartered two new working groups that are going to start functioning in London this is a great opportunity to, to come in and start looking at something from the, from the ground up. If you try to catch up on some of the other working groups, you're, you're gonna find five, 10, 30 years of backlog sometimes. Here, it's a great opportunity because you can get in on the ground floor. So these two protocols are gonna be, um, I'm gonna call them hybrid protocols. They're a mixture of distance vector and link state protocols. Uh, and the two working groups, one is called RIFT, Routing and Fat Trace. Uh, Jeff over here is going to be the, the chair of that. If you have any questions or interests, he can describe the protocol. And the other one is uh, called LSVR, Link State Vector Routing. This is a protocol that's going to use the BGP transport and uh, packet formats and BGP LS to carry link state information and then run basically the extra over that. So they're both intended to be standalone protocols that are more purpose built for data center environments. If that is something that interests you, please come to the ATF, or as Warren already said, subscribe to the list, and you can follow all the discussions there, provide your opinion, which is very, very important, so that we can design something that is going to actually work and be used uh, by, by all of you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Lee Howard, I'm one of uh, two members of the Internet Architecture Board, the IAB here. Um, the IAB has basically two roles, um, an administrative role when somebody says we need the IETF to send us a liaison or appoint somebody to, to such and such body. Uh, we, we turn the crank on that process. And the other role is looking at larger architecture uh, kinds of, of concerns and issues. Uh, from time to time, we decide that those architectural uh, concerns, the broad, long-term, forward-looking things uh, that, that somebody needs to be thinking about uh, could be uh, better informed by having a workshop of people who have something to say on a topic. And so we will convene a workshop uh, to say, uh, where, where is the internet going and where should it be going? And is there work that we need to do to make sure that uh, these things, that we, all these independently developed protocols don't fall apart when we put them together? 
Uh, so we had one uh, that we, we called ename, explicit naming workshop, that was, uh, it was a, a, a more or less, a, a, a lesser defined problem statement uh, than many of our past workshops around how we identify uh, objects, uh, things on the internet. And so there were uh, issues of uh, different character sets being used for naming and with sometimes overlapping characters and uh, how, how names and numbers get resolved in ways other than DNS. Um, so it, was, it turned into a really interesting uh, uh, back and forth kind of, of uh, interactive uh, uh, workshop more than, than some of our previous ones have. Uh, we have a list of programs, um, so you can sort of infer from these what they are. We've got a, a privacy and security program. So programs are how the IAB organizes our work. So we, and they aren't just IAB members. Uh, we, we include other IETF participants and other people from outside who are not regular IETF participants sometimes who have expertise that will help us do that work. Privacy and security, stack evolution, like up and down the IP, uh, uh, the, 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 the protocol stack. Uh, the uh, RSOC, the RS, RFC series oversight. Uh, we have a technical plenary uh, at, every, at almost every IETF, and so we've organized our planning for that into a program. Uh, oversight of liaisons and uh, stewardship of, of the IANA uh, uh, parameters that IETF uh, interacts with. And then we've uh, recently uh, put forward a couple of documents, uh, and you can go read those. We highly recommend that. And Jeff. So as you know, <coughs> uh, ITF is divided in areas, and every area is pretty self-contained. What we do in AIB, we try to take wider look at architectural aspects, at uh, issues such as low latency or visualization that are not only limited to a particular area, but are across low latencies, anything from layer zero to layer seven. So we publish documents, and I've mentioned two here, that try to provide comprehensive view of particular topic, latency in this case, and contributors to latency and how we deal with it, not only in particular routing or operational area, but across ATF. So if you've got great ideas, come to us. We are open, and we'll be working on it. Great. So um, what's next? <clears throat> so as we've said a couple of times, shortly after this, you can't hear me? Better? OK. Now we can't see the screen. Um, anyway, so yeah, as I said, we're going to be hanging around outside um, in the big tent. So just before we are in gear, come along and talk to us. We're all fairly, fairly recognizable. Um, what else does that say? Oh, yeah, or at any other time. I guess I could also look at the big screen. Um, but you know, specifically, if you have any drafts that you've heard about and you have concerns about them, or you think that they're not going to work properly in your network, or you know, if you think that we need more input. Oh, thank you, Eric. That's so much better. Um, you know, we can provide some information to us, and we can try and take it back to the working group. Or better yet, we might be able to put you in touch with the authors and the working group, and that way you can provide your feedback directly, which you know always works a lot better. Um, we've also been discussing. You know, if this seems to be useful, having something like a buff or a track or something similar at future nanogs, where we can all sit down in a room together and sort of some authors, and we have a lot of people who participate in both spaces, and you know, sit down, discuss, get more information and feedback. Um, and also, if you have any questions or anything else, or questions about the IETF, how to participate, etc., please come along and talk to us. Um, so. I asked the panelists to all speak for about three minutes. To be honest, I didn't really think that they would keep it to that. So I think we've got some extra time. So we've got lots of time for questions. Or uh, Hi, Dan Bogdanovich, and I'm a vendor. And I've been <laughs> participating in the ITF for many, many years. So one of the things that we have been working in the uh, management groups on the, the, on the models, and uh, one of the big problem is that we are seeing service models that we are mainly proposed by vendors, and we have no idea if those service models are any useful mm -hmm. to network operators. Most of the service models that I've seen, if they don't have any network operator input, I discount it immediately because I'm saying this is a vendor pipe dream. But now I will also issue a criticism on some of the ITF uh, process and this is the document. The, the, you know, how in order, if you want to propose something to the ITF, writing an ITF draft 
if you have to put a lot of graphics in it, <laughs> it's painful. I wrote so many stuff in SIP and writing, you know, the packet exchanges in SIP were one, was the, my, my, one of my most painful experiences ever writing documentation. And that was almost now 20 years ago. Nothing has changed there. Make it easier. I know that it has been trying for a long time to update the documentation, but make it easier to submit the initial document, especially when you have a lot of graphics, to do that. And that's what I believe increased participation. As a matter of fact, we have revised the RFC format, um, and, and there will be, and uh, SVGs will be allowed in uh, upcoming internet drafts. So if you have a tool that can draw images that way. Uh, and uh, the other thing that is often convenient is to partner with somebody who has written, t written drafts or, or RFCs before who can at least handle some of the XML and, and dumb formatting tricks for you. But I mean, but that's also, it is a really good point. A lot of stuff is often driven by vendors. Yeah. Um, and you know, your vendors are spending a lot of time building things. If they're not actually what you need, that's not useful. It's a waste of your time and ours. And you know, code gets built for stuff you don't need. So please, again, come along and tell us what you need. You know, we need your help to build what you need. And I think Rudiger was next. Uh, oh, Warren. Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, I would like to yeah. just answer about the service models, right? <laughs> uh, I, I agree that service models on by vendor is the wrong way to go. We did like two experiments in the ITF. One was an L3VPN service model, and we're finishing up a second one with an L2VPN. We made sure that they were done by operators only. There is not a single vendor. Okay, good. Go to the mic if you want. Now, I mean, the two experiments we did were done only by operators. We excluded any vendors out of that. Now, to find those operators ready to work on the uh, L2 VPN, it was quite a challenge, right? So if you are interested to work on those service models, right, speak to us. Now, the device model, as you mentioned, because you mentioned two service models out of many device level, right? The device level one should be done by vendors, right? Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Rudiger for Deutsche Telekom. Uh, well, okay, if I move to the microphone first uh, to add, I think, a missing piece that uh, Warren should have put in. Uh, you mentioned, or someone mentioned, the upcoming short-term London meeting. Uh, you might have also pointed to the summer meeting on this continent <laughs> and ah! the privilege yeah. of this continent that it is visited by this traveling circus <laughs> once a year, which is not true for all the continents. That's true. If we could move some of the other continents closer, uh, and they were, you know, <laughs> astray, well, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't want the seismic, the seismic, and other effects that would have, uh, that that would cause. Um, uh, the discussions, the discussions that came up uh, from Dean actually uh, also prompt some comments. Uh, actually, my observations, in, uh, and well, okay, I should point out also explicitly, I'm an operator. And I have been in the IETF since summer 89. Um, uh, uh, actually, my observation for the graphs in the, uh, are, uh, in the drafts and so on is that actually uh, uh, I feel that a large part of what is done in the ASCII art actually should be done rather in symbolic language in symbolic high-level language, rather than the ASCII art, I have seen too many very complicated proposals where the uh, authors were just completely already taken away by doing the ASCII art and completely losing the sight of the actual semantic concepts. So that's something that I would hope uh, actually, the culture in the IETF changes. Um, uh, the other thing is uh, the question about uh, doing the models with operator input. Um, uh, in my environment, 
I'm seeing, I'm seeing that uh, uh, some of the colleagues that actually should be doing that kind of stuff uh, probably could use very serious support on the learning curve to actually, to actually transport their domain knowledge into the mo modeling language. Um, and I'm, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure what really can be done about that from the IETF side, but I think, I think, I think uh, a kind of, a lot of a distance that we have between what the modeling community actually would like to see from the, uh, from the operators and the other way around uh, is really, is really a, a consequence of uh, the new technology being really absorbed and taken up and used. So with regards to data modeling, at least speaking as a routing working group chair, every meeting I try to have 15, 20 minutes of just knowledge session on data modeling. How do you do this? How do you combine, uh, thanks to this gentleman over there who's usually presenting, how do you build products using data modeling, putting them together, service model, network model, device model, how do you bind them together? So come to us, at least listen and see. We are trying to explain, we are trying to educate people. Yeah. Uh, that's really a uh, kind of a problem because the number of people that actually need that education really cannot be expected to show up in any working group or even get the travel justification to the IETF. Absolutely, Meet Echo is there. We would be more than happy to do this here at Nanak. So every Nanak could be, we could have a slot used for data modeling. And again, you don't need to go to IETF to participate. There is Meet Echo, you could present remotely, you could participate remotely. Pretty much 90% of the work could be done remotely. Yeah, actually, I just wanted to uh, follow up on that. Uh, the meetings that we were mentioning, we're going to meet a, a, about a month from now in London. In July, it's going to be in Montreal, uh, up north from here. And in November, we're going to go to Bangkok. Um, as we've all said, you don't have to go. You can subscribe to the mailing list. Meet Echo is this really cool tool that you can participate remotely. We have not only the ability for you to see what's happening, participate in uh, you know, live Java rooms and things uh, along those lines, but we've had a number of people present remotely. In fact, several working group chairs have chaired the working groups remotely yeah. as well. Um, another initiative that we have started actually uh, in conjunction with uh, LAGNOG in Latin America has been the ability to, to or not the ability, the, the idea of building hubs of participation. So the topic of not being able to go to meetings because they're expensive, because they're far away, it's you know, the same for everyone. And so what we've done there is we have promoted uh, local groups. So you get your friends, you sit there, instead of sitting by yourself in your underwear watching the, the, the screen, you sit with your friends, hopefully not in your underwear. <laughs> and, okay, in your underwear, that's fine. And you can now have a community of interest. So you get all the people that want to talk about models, uh, I don't have any friends like that. And <laughs> you talk. <laughs> okay, I have one friend like that. Uh, and I'm not going to say And there is one more hub in Bangalore and one in Boston. Yes, so there are your remote hubs that we have. Uh, at least five or 600 people participating remotely at each ITF, plus another 1,000 that show up uh, in, you know, in person. So it, it happens all around the world. And then it's a nice thing to do when there's you know, a short difference from, uh, you know, we meet in Europe, so it's a short difference, only five hours, uh, in the case of London, from here. Uh, or if we're meeting in North America, then it's a lot easier to participate in, in, in most of the meetings as well. Hi, uh, Jan Federen, Bloomberg LP. So the comment that I have is, so I've been an operator for the last 20 years. I've been following ITF work. It's amazing. There is a lot of progress. But the one thing that's, I guess, the perception that exists is that you know, ITF is ultimately like an organization of, in many ways, protocol developers. Like low level building blocks are being developed and we operators put those building blocks together. So it's not that, it's not that ITF doesn't listen to the operators. It's, it's almost like there is no way for the ITF to be able to listen to the operators. 
and I wish there would be more, you know, more ways in, that ITF could come up with that you know, just use the operators. And I don't think that's actually been quite that well, uh, well developed because sometimes the operators just can't necessarily fit in into the type of work that ITF is doing. Can, can I? Please. So um, there are actually several groups in the operations and management area that deal specifically with operations. So yeah, I see two places where, where it's very important, the input of operators. One is before we do stuff, right, to make sure that we actually do something that's going to be relevant and valuable. And the other one is once we do it, and we start getting uh, deployment and operational implementation experience, then it's very important to come back. And for us to understand you know, what's happening and how the protocols are being used and what is working and what is not working. So the operations area actually has several working groups on uh, DNS operations, on routing operations, on V6 um, operations. <laughs> operations, of course, uh, on multicast operations, on, on different things where the drivers of all that are operators. Uh, in fact, uh, hopefully Job is going to talk about that because he participates actively in one in several of those operator groups, and I think you know there's work that is being driven out of there. And on uh, another side, we are trying to cut the amount of time needed to respin, so this version could be respinned in months, not years as before, and there are good examples of that. Yeah. Quick comment. The only thing that sometimes seem that's, seems that's missing is that, yes, there's definitely all those operational groups that where operational experience can be discussed. But what sometimes seems that what, what is missing is the ability to take, let's say, you know, protocols that were developed and then try to find a, and then look at various like uses of those protocols, like how to actually put this together, how to integrate it with the existing systems, and that sometimes gets you know, is not seen as much as it could be. Thank you. So Job, is going to be using you as an example of where things worked well. So try not to throw me under the bus too much here. Uh, to, to, to respond to your uh, remark, if we consider ITF as the provider of small building blocks, and then as operators, we assemble the building blocks into higher level structures, uh, as we see in protocol design, it is extremely hard to signal from a higher layer to a lower layer. And, and we will keep struggling with this. I don't expect uh, there is a, a real solution other than just keep meeting and keep banging heads to the, together. Um, in, in that regard, the vendors were supposed to be the proxies of the operators, and the vendors were supposed to represent <laughs> my interests in the ITF and get stuff done. Oh, Sometimes that, work that works. <laughs> um, like, I think beer is a good example of that. Uh, I don't know why it's called beer in Dutch, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> uh, but, but sometimes that, that proxy function does not work, and then operators show up uh, with pitchforks and, and push things through. Um, earlier you mentioned, Warren, uh, perhaps look for help uh, from somebody that's more experienced uh, with writing internet drafts. Uh, the invitation I would like to extend to this crowd and, and beyond, if you have an idea and you can tell the idea just in plain English, you can email either Warren, myself, or Greg Hankins, or there's a number of folks, or, or the old people. <laughs> all that is needed is just that you express an idea in English and then transforming that into the, the XML thing, that's, that's the easy part. So just email us and, and we'll get going. And if it's routing related, routing working group is the place. If it's not specifically about SPF, BGP, or anything self-contained, we are open to talk about anything. So um, we're very close to out of time. I had one quick question. We sort of discussed possibly having something like a BOF or a tracker or something similar in future meetings. Um, if we were to do that, are people kind of somewhat interested? Like, does that seem like things, something you might be interested in participating? I guess show of hands or something, or hum or throw things, or do a little dance. Okay. Okay, that's good. Good to know. Okay. Um, I think that we're the only thing that stands between you and beer and gear now, or is there? And some announcements. And some announcements. Yeah. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.